So this evening, what I thought I would do is I would have a quick recap on some of the things which you've quite possibly um, will remember from from um, when you were when those of you who were part of the research or I've heard from from other people. And then I'll look at what what we found during the research and uh, and then we'll go on to look at um, what's going to happen next. I'm also very pleased to say that um, there's been some some more research done elsewhere um, in uh, in the last couple of years uh, at St Magnus Cathedral in Kirkwall and Dr Antonio Thomas's work up there with a team of volunteers very similar to to the original stonemasons marked research um, have recorded graffiti as well as mason's marks um, apparently they they regard um, mason's marks as as a simple subset of graffiti but find that's um, found been found on the building um, and i'll just remind you that all the other research that has taken place with the exception of um, some recording done by Moira Gregg about 10 years ago uh, has all happened in, in England and Wales. Um, and there's nothing at all in the last hundred years that has, uh, has happened in Scotland. So let's begin with a recap then um, and look at um, uh, uh, what is a Mason's Mark. Um, and a mason's mark, very simply, is a sequence of lines cut into the face of a piece of carved stone to indicate who, the, who worked that stone. It's the I made this mark. Um, and here's uh, an example of a very simple three line mark. Um, here's a slightly more complicated one. Um, and then another three line mark um, in the shape of a bow tie. And if you compare the first and third, you can see that um, with just three simple lines, you can create uh, a very different mark, um, which is something that the Masons had to do um, to ensure that they weren't using the same mark as anybody else. Of course, when we talk about buildings like Glasgow Cathedral or, or the Borders Abbeys or the castles of Scotland, we talk about Bishop X built the cathedral or Lord Y built the castle and of course they may have paid for or ordered it to be built but it was built by skilled craftsmen whose identity is lost to us apart from the marks which remain uh, on the buildings that they were involved with. So why does those stonemasons marks exist? Well first of all they exist as quarry marks, a piece of stone coming from a quarry um, would have a simple mark cut on it to identify which um, project it was going um, uh, going to. Um, and a lady called um, Margaret Green, who wrote, who's a geologist, who wrote, wrote a book about the geology of the buildings of Glasgow, identified that a lot of the stone at Glasgow Cathedral, in its earliest iteration, um, actually came from a quarry where Queen Street Station is now. And the tunnel was actually built through the quarry, um, which had been excavated to, to produce stone for some of the early buildings. The next most common is banker's marks, uh, the banker being the bench on which the mason works. And this is the one that survives the most. Um, banker's marks identify to us who it was that cut that stone. Um, but they more importantly identified who the mason was um, so that they ensured that he got paid. Position marks are not particularly common in the surveying um, that has been undertaken so far. There seem to be more position marks um, found in England and Wales. Um, and these are the marks which bridge across the joint of two pieces of stone uh, telling the mason, the setting mason, um, where the two stones are to join up. They, the marks were used as a form of quality control. Um, the clerk of works, who would probably be the only literate person 
um, on the site would be uh, probably a, an, an abbot or a, or a priest, um, and he would record the number of stones that were completed each day by each mason by looking at the marks on the stones. So they were a way of product, monitoring production rates and ensuring that they got paid. And to give you an idea of this, the standard rectangular masons, uh, sorry, the rectangular uh, ashlar blocks in Glasgow Cathedral, which are approximately 20, 24 inches wide and about 15 inches high, um, a skilled mason would only produce six or seven of those a day, um, for which he would probably be paid about a shilling. Um, if he was lucky. Uh, and out of that, he had to buy his own tools, his clothing, and feed and pay his apprentice as well. Um, so a bit like archaeology, you were never going to get rich being a stonemason. So where do the marks come from? Well, I propose that many of the marks that we found uh, in Scotland um, are actually of runic origin. Um, and they come from two main sources, from the Elder Futark, which is the ancient Germanic alphabet of the second to the eighth centuries, and the Younger Futark, which is uh, Scandinavian, um, and from the eighth century. Um, and the Younger Futark um, does differ quite a bit um, from, the, from its, uh, its older brother. Um, here we have the Elder Futark uh, showing you um, the, the runic symbols in red and the letters from the Roman alphabet, the corresponding letters from the Roman alphabet um, in black. And the Younger Futark um, does differ if we just take the letter G, for example, in the Elder Futark is, is an X. Um, and then by the time the younger Futark came into use, um, the letters G and K had the same mark, as did the, 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 um, the letter or sound NG, and they shared the same mark. So there's some complexity coming into the use of these, uh, of these symbols uh, as the, the alphabet um, uh, matured. 17 of the Elder Futark um, marks have been seen as Mason's marks and 18 of the marks from the Younger Futark have been found as well. Um, if we take the Elder Futark first of all and we look at the letter B, um, we can see that there is some similarity to a capital B in that mark. Um, the letter D bears no resemblance at all to what we know to be the letter D, um, and the letter H um, has some similarity to a capital H, but not, uh, not particularly close. If we look at the younger Futark though, um, life starts to get a little bit confusing. The letter B is the same. The letter D is a completely different form, and so is the letter H. So there's a divergence here. Um, and the suggestion that I've made is that when a mason cut his uh, mark on a piece of stone, the letter that he was cutting, um, the, the mark that he was cutting, was the letter of his first name. So it was effectively his signature. Um, and, and that would be sufficient to identify him as a mason working uh, and entitled to be paid for the work that he had done. We looked in the research at what mason's marks can tell us. We tried to uh, find out what um, we could about the size of the, the skilled workforce. Um, and the proviso with this, as with so much with stone mason's marks, is that we cannot be sure what the total number of masons were working on a site at any one time. Um, and, and we simply, we can simply say that at least 
ex masons or why masons have worked on the site. Um, we can look at distribution patterns of, of masons marks um, within sites and across sites. And within sites, we can look at um, the occurrence of masons marks on, on simpler ashlar wall block um, in the lower parts of the building. And then we find window arches and doorways and so on in the upper parts of the building with the same masons mark on it. Uh, and it may be possible to say that that mate was the same mason um, working over 10 or 15 years and that his skills had developed uh, and that he, ha he had now moved on to making more complex uh, cuts in stone. Um, it tells us a little bit about the mobility of the workforce. And again, there's a proviso here. Um, and there's more ifs, buts and maybes with Mason's marks than there is with um, almost anything else that I've come across um, uh, since, since um, starting to study uh, archaeology. The same mark appearing at four or five different uh, uh, sites doesn't mean it's the same Mason. Even if the marks were made in the same quarter of a century, it's unlikely that they will be the same, uh, be the same Mason. Um, and I'll come on to talk about why that's probably the case uh, shortly. Um, I mentioned uh, distribution and we can see changing skill levels um, uh, occurring on some sites. Um, possible family connections is another one, uh, and I'll be coming on to talk about that in a minute and talking about how um, a, a son or grandson couldn't adopt his father or grandfather's mark if they were both working on the same site, and he would need to change the mark slightly. He may want to use the same mark, but he would need to change it slightly to ensure that, he, uh, that his work wasn't confused with somebody else's. So here's some simple examples of, of two and three line marks. Um, very straightforward. And again, a big difference between the triangle in the middle and the inverted Y uh, on the right. Um, but, you know, three lines nonetheless. And these have, all three of these have been found at, at Glasgow Cathedral. Some more complex examples. Um, and some of these are really quite stretching credulity. Um, and here we have four examples um, of very complex Mason's marks. The top left has nine lines, uh, the bottom left has seven lines, uh, the middle mark has eight lines, and the one on the right has, <coughs> excuse me, has 13 lines. And that's a mark from outside the north door um, at Glasgow Cathedral. There was a suggestion made some time ago, 50 or 100 years ago, that the more, the more lines a mason's mark had, the better the mason. And you would think that, that if that was the case, then all of the more complex marks would be found on the more detailed carvings, windows, um, door frames, um, decorative pieces, and so on and so forth. But that has not proved to be the case um, because it would also mean that the mason was adding lines to his mark as his skills progressed um, and, and that is generally thought to be unlikely um, certainly in talking to modern masons um, they stick to the mark which they select um, when they qualify as a mason some of you will remember this form. This is the, um, the survey recording form. Um, and um, this started from a blank piece of paper um, and a few suggestions from, uh, from Ian Marshall, amongst others, actually, um, about um, what information we could record and, and how we should go about it. The form itself, this is version 10, I think, um, much amended uh, and mainly thanks to suggestions from volunteers who participated in the surveys who said it would be easier if this or that or there isn't a box for so-and-so 
um, uh, and that, that sort of thing. So um, it has devel developed and evolved um, thanks to the participation of the, of, of the volunteers who took part in the surveying. This particular mark, um, five pointed star, um, which is shown full size there, um, is found at Glasgow Cathedral. And you can see on the right hand side there, you've got wall block and pillar. And down here, E means area E within the, um, within the cathedral, which if memory sells me correctly, A, B, C, D, E is the inside of the east wall of the choir. So the far eastern end of the building, one occurrence there. And pillar five in the choir um, on the southeast face, three occurrences. So the same mason was working on, on that pillar um, and generated, uh, generated his marks uh, there. Right. Um, I mentioned the question of of um, two masons not being able to use uh, the same mark because one might get paid for everything and the other wouldn't get paid for anything. And this led me on to investigate uh, what is known as uh, modifiers. And if we take a look at a possible route how how this might happen, um, if we start off with a very simple. Um, X, which you will remember was the letter G in the in the younger futar, sorry, in the elder futar. Um, if we add a if we add a, a line or two lines to it, um, we come up with something like this. If we then add some more lines or alter it slightly, we turn the two top wings to both point outwards, um, and then we add another tail. Um, we've got five different marks, which all started life as possibly as an X. And as other Masons came in and said, well, my name's, I don't know what Scandinavian equivalent of George is. Um, my name's George and this is my mark. And the clerk of work said, well, you can't use that because it's already in use. You need to add a line to it. You need to modify your mark. And there's lots of different ways that this can happen. For instance, if we take the same X again and we change it in a, in a different way by adding a, a letter, uh, a vertical line down the middle of it, um, we end up with a six pointed star basically. We can then add uh, a horizontal line through it and that gives us uh, the, uh, the eight pointed star. And then we can even add a little tail onto it um, which takes it in a slightly different direction. And the issue of um, familial connection um, might be resolved by this, by somebody taking the mark and adding a tail or adding a line so that it was similar to, but I, you know, could be identified as being separate from the mark of, of the father or the grandfather. So let's have a look then at um, the marks that were found during the research. Um, this, this table shows you um, down the left hand side, obviously, the, the, the sites that were surveyed. Um, and it also gives us the total number of different mark forms. Um, and so we found 867 different mark forms lots of different variations of those mark forms. And we found 2,781 occurrences of Mason's marks on the building, uh, on the buildings generated by 867 different Masons. Um, it's possible, of course, that, that because interpretation gets in the way that some of them may have been miscounted and, and it may be plus or minus, but it gives you a rough idea. And if you look in the column, the total number of different mark forms, you can see, not surprisingly, that Glasgow Cathedral with 490 uh, different marks um, 
far, far and away more than any of the other buildings. And both Glasgow Cathedral and Paisley Abbey have had, for most of their life, a roof on them, which has protected them from the weather and saved the marks from being eroded. Burlton Castle and Kelso Abbey, uh, which are effectively both ruins, um, could only offer us two Mason's marks each, although I don't doubt that there was many, um, many, many more than that and probably similar to Bodwell Castle at the top of the list there as far as Dilton is concerned. So the key thing is the 600, 867 different mark forms, suggesting that's the number of masons that we've identified as having worked at, that, at the, these sites, and just under 2,800 um, marks uh, in total. Um, this gives you an idea of what the um, the dating of Mason's marks tells us. Um, we are, I analyzed the marks by um, century, um, counted all, all the marks, all 2,800 of them, and uh, allocated a date, a century date to them based on um, the construction phases listed in Canmore. Um, and this gives you some idea of, of what the, um, what, what the, the dating looks like 13th century not surprised surprising that we we looked at all of the buildings that had been started before or during the 13th century um, it surprised me that there was so many in the 15th century um, but places like cross ragul and one or two others were being rebuilt by that stage um, so that that might well explain that um, the 20th century marks um, is quite quite interesting but all of those um were found at paisley abbey um paisley abbey was was rebuilt the, the choir was rebuilt um just prior to and during this first world war um and the ambulatory around the um uh, courtyard um was also rebuilt um a lot of stone was reused, but a lot of new stone had to be incorporated. Uh, and we picked up those marks um, from the reconstructions. 99 at the end there is marks that we were unable to identify a, uh, a date for. Um, and here we have the same thing broken down um, and showing you in numeric format. And we can see that far and away, the biggest number nearly 1200 marks um, at Glasgow Cathedral, again with a peak uh, in, the in the 15th century, and the same thing at, um, at uh, Cross Ragul. Melrose, um, surprisingly, I, I always thought Melrose was much earlier, um, but it would seem that there's a fairly big um, concentration either of build, rebuild, in the 15th century. And then here we have 261 marks from Paisley uh, from the 20th century, which um, uh, I wasn't expecting at all. Um, but it's nice that those marks are there uh, and that we can identify the dating phases of the reconstruction from them. Here we have some slightly different figures, and this tells us of the different um, mark forms at each site. Again, if we if we start at the bottom, Paisley Abbey, we had 119 different marks, um, of which 66 were unique to the site. They weren't found anywhere else. Glasgow, 508, um, of which 421 weren't found anywhere else. When I say anywhere else, I mean at the other sites surveyed rather than um, at all. Uh, and the interesting thing for that is that it tells us a little bit about um, the commitment that stonemasons made. They got to work at somewhere like Glasgow Cathedral, and uh, that's probably where they work for their entire working life. Um, there was no old age pension, so they carried on working because it was the only way that they could um, the only way that they could survive. 
And talking of lifespans, um, take one example um, of uh, a mark at Melrose Abbey. Um, this is a mark, um, mark M020. Um, and there are seven occurrences of this at, at Melrose Abbey. Um, and you can see from the data there, type of stone that it was found on and the dating phase of the, the construction at Melrose. So there was one mark, oh, sorry, three marks found during the first quarter of the 15th century. So that's from 1400 to 1425. And then the other four marks are dated to parts of the abbey which were built during the second quarter of the 15th century. Um, so up until 1450. Um, and again, you can see that the same mark has been found on Ashler wall block, on windows and engaged columns. Uh, that's a column that protrudes in part from, from a vertical wall. Now, the interesting thing about this is that it would suggest that Masons did a number of different things and effectively did whatever was needed to be done at that stage of the building and didn't just say, right, well, I, you know, I'm too good to do ashlar wall blocks now. I want to do um, fancy stuff. Um, and basically they got given what needed to be done and they got on with it. We also found the same mark at six other sites. So it'd be interesting to do, I haven't done a comparison yet, but it would be interesting to do a comparison of similar of other marks that are found at multiple different sites and look in more detail at the, the, the time scale of their um, coming into being. Here we have um, uh, a graph showing you the various forms of mark um, that have been found. And far and away, um, the most common uh, shape is something resembling a triangle. Um, and here we have three examples of marks that were categorized as triangles uh, or incorporating triangles. A little bit of subjectivity here because the the third one, the bottom one on, on that of the three, um, could well have started life as an X and had two vertical lines um, attached to it. Um, and, and we will never know whether that was the case or not. But it goes from um, triangle forms to uh, letter X forms. And here's, again, three examples uh, of marks incorporating letter Xs. The bottom left one is very similar to the mark which started all this off. It's the mark on the Springer on the fireplace at Crookston Castle. Um, and when I went there to do some um, to do some uh, surveying for for something else for the National Trust for Scotland, um, Derek uh, Alexander said to me, "Well, you're there. Have a look and see if you can see any mason marks." So it's all his fault, um, and I've uh, I've sort of followed my nose on this ever since. But that mark is only visible there because the the um, the, the arch over the fireplace uh, fell down many years ago, or was taken down because it was unsafe. Here's uh, three more of what I've categorised as miscellaneous forms because I couldn't come up with anything. Um, to describe them other than that. Um, and then finally, um, three examples of, of arrowhead forms, um, which are very different, um, and uh, but all incorporate something which we would recognize as, uh, as an arrow. Um, and it, and it, the list goes all the way down to um, bottom there, hashtag forms and cup forms, where there's only um, maybe one or two um, examples uh, that have been found. So let's go back to Glasgow Cathedral and look at a little bit more detail at what was found there, because so many of you um, participated in the uh, in the surveying. Um, 
we found 1,454 marks. Um, and I would just clarify that, that the surveying was undertaken to record those marks which were easily and safely accessible, either on the ground floor of the nave and the choir or the lower, the lower church, or um, up in the triforium, triforium and clear story, where we could get at them to measure them. And that was the sort of the rule to try and stop the more enthusiastic university students from falling out the clear story and ending up on the floor of the nave clutching clipboard with my form on it. Um, we identified 500 and different, 508 different masons. Um, and I wouldn't suggest that that was the total number of masons that have worked at Glasgow Cathedral. And there's two reasons for that. Firstly, because there's obviously a lot of marks that we couldn't get at to measure, um, or that have been eroded uh, and are no longer visible. Um, but also that Historic Scotland's uh, instructions to its stonemasons is that they are not to put their marks on replacement stones that they're incorporating in the building um, during refurbishments which take place, um, which I find a bit disappointing because there'll be lots of data and records about when that bit of stone was put in place, but you cannot go along and look at that piece of stone and say, oh, there's a mason's mark on that, and look in the record and find out who the mason was. So there's a gap being created in the, in the record of, of what's happening uh, these days. We found 421 marks unique to Glasgow. Um, and uh, that's quite a high, high proportion, 82%. Um, lots, of, lots of reasons for that. Um, it was a prestigious site. The Masons would go there and, and because it was, uh, it had a certain um, uh, cachet in working on it, um, they might well stay there their, their whole working life um, and not work anywhere else. 650 hours of surveying were carried out um, at, at Glasgow Cathedral with over 1200 hours in total on the project. Um, many of you came to uh, Paisley Abbey as well, uh, and to um, Cross Ragul. So about 1,200 hours in total spent surveying uh, by volunteers, which is absolutely wonderful. And, and the research just wouldn't have been done without that, um, that commitment uh, and that enthusiasm from you all. Um, Mason's marks at Glasgow Cathedral. I analysed the marks at the cathedral by the number of lines um, from which they were constructed. And we came up with a graph that looks like this. So the vast majority, over 350, 380, I think, marks have four lines. And you can see the distribution pattern for the other marks. Um, Four lines seems to be the normal, and that was what we what we identified um, in uh, when we look at all of the marks across all the sites. Um, and uh, we've you can see down here there's some very slight um, marks showing um, that some masons marks had fourteen or fifteen lines. Don't really understand that. A mason has to put his mark on the stone, um, but it's a necessary evil and he doesn't really want to waste his time making a very complex mark, um, which is cut freehand. And the more complex, the more likely it is that it's, um, it's going to go wrong. Um, but some of the marks that we found did have, have that many lines, which, I, I, as I say, I think is quite strange. So I mentioned skill distribution and, uh, and work patterns. Um, and from Glasgow, we find this one. Um, and we found 15 occurrences of it. And again, you can see that um, it appeared uh, in the lower church on the north wall, um, on pillars in the lower church. It appears on the, on the choir, uh, on the south wall. Um, 
outside the north door and upstairs in the triforium uh, on the staircase and outside the west door. Um, so it's quite widespread. Um, but also we found the same mark at Bovwell. Um, and we found 10 occurrences of that of this mark uh, there. Um, and one of the things I'm looking to do is to, to, to examine that and look at dating uh, of the phases at Glasgow to see whether it's one or more masons and also to see if the if it's possible that the mason at Bothwell um, was working at the same time it's going to be a different mason that will come um, the same only different and this is an this, I think this is a wonderful collection because it tells us quite a bit about the variety of the form that marks take all 12 of these were found at Glasgow Cathedral. Um, now it's entirely possible that these were all cut freehand by the same mason, but it's also possible that some of them were cut by apprentices. If uh, a mason had an apprentice, he would the, the, the apprentice would eventually have enough skill to cut an ashlar block, which was square enough and the right size to fit into the wall and the mason would instruct the apprentice to put his put the mason's mark on it because the mason would get paid and from that he would then pay the apprentice um, so the bottom left one uh, and the top right are both quite skewed um, and it's possible that they were cut by an apprentice who wasn't used to cutting the shape and so probably wouldn't do quite as good a job of it as as his master would here we have four similar marks from paisley and um, slightly more uniform but you can see the second one down uh, the two lines don't quite join up at the ends and then from dryborough jedborough and bothwell um, we have uh, one mark each and again, you can see that there's variations to to there to the formats there. And again, these four are from Melrose, much more uniform. And I would suggest that all four of these were cut by the mason himself, um, who who would be better used to doing a good job of it, cutting it freehand. Here's something a little bit different from Glasgow. I mentioned the north door before, and here we have. Um, some multiple marks on the same piece of stone. Um, in this photograph, you can see in the top left, um, a quite complex mark, 10 lines. Um, and bottom right, you can see, we've seen that mark before, I mentioned it earlier. Um, it's been filled in with cement for some reason and it's been hacked about a bit, um, along with the other graffiti. Uh, but this gives you an idea of, of two marks appearing on the same piece of stone. And here in this photograph, we have two marks appearing on the, another piece of stone, which is actually adjacent to the first one. And um, I can show you the drawings of these. Um, there you go, that makes, maybe makes the images a little bit clearer. Um, lots of questions about these. Um, it, uh, why did we end up with two marks on one piece of stone outside the, what would have been the main working door of the cathedral. And then two marks on the stone next to it. It could well be that these four marks were put there by the master masons who were in charge of the construction of the, the, the cathedral. Uh, three of the four, that's not counting the bottom left one, um, only appear at this location at, um, at Glasgow Cathedral and don't appear anywhere else uh, at the other sites that were surveyed. So it could be interpreted that this is the master mason putting his mark outside the entrance to the building to say that he is approved, he has approved of the quality of work that has been done. Um, under his supervision. Um, and I challenge anybody to prove me different. 
Um, interpretation, I, I hope I've given you a very clear steer that there's been there's a lot of interpretation in this. Um, and and a lot of um, what I've suggested is, um, is without real substance to back it up. Um, and it's a case of, I hope, me saying this is a possible interpretation. Um, and I'm open to suggestions if anybody has any other ideas. Let's start with putting a name to the mark. I had hoped by using the People of Medieval Scotland website, uh, known as POMS, uh, which incorporates all the charters and documents that have survived from the medieval period, um, that I would be able to find um, reference to Masons at particular buildings and find their marks uh, on the documents um, and say, right, that's definitely George the Mason. Um, and that's his mark. Unfortunately, that hasn't happened um, because the digital versions of the people of medieval Scotland website um, don't have the the actual the images of the signatures or the Mason's marks on the bottom of them. Um, and it would be necessary to persuade somebody at the National Library to dig the charters out from wherever they're kept and put on a piece of white a pair of white gloves and have a look through them and see what we can um, see what we can find. I mentioned the problem of, of identifying different masons at different time periods using the same mark. Uh, great care needs to be taken uh, to ensure that we're not um, thinking that the marks all belong to the same mason and not all of the same marks are the same it's entirely possible some of the marks that have been categorized as one thing could well be another um, and the example of the the difference between an x and and the bow tie um, is, is just one example of that and not all different marks are different it's again it's entirely possible that some of the marks that have been categorized as being different um, are actually the same, um, but have been categorized like that because of the way they've been cut, where they tend to look like something else. So what's next? Well, some additional surveying at Glasgow Cathedral and at Cross Regal and Glenluce Abbeys. Um, and what I'd like to do there, hopefully with the, with, um, contributions from ACFA members is to produce elevation drawings of the chapter houses at all three uh, locations uh, to work out how many masons worked on the construction of the uh, of the chapter house and see whether there's any overlap and there may well be overlap between Cross Ragul and Glenluce. Um, and also to to look at workload and see whether some masons were producing far more than others, um, and see what we can we see what we can t tell about that. Um, hoping to continue surveying, um, but um, taking a slightly different direction with this and using it as an opportunity to encourage community engagement um, at local historic buildings. Um, and Dundonald and Nerdross and Castles are two examples of that, where there's uh, local organisations working with Historic Scotland um, to manage the presentation of, of the buildings. Um, and the hope is that this will encourage hands-on engagement with, with buildings. I know at Ardrossan, the work that's been done there has led to um, a much greater feeling of ownership of the buildings by people in the community. Um, and things like graffiti and littering and so on and so forth um, around, excuse me, around the castle uh, has dropped away to almost nothing as people learn about local history and learn about its significance and learn that, you know, they actually have a sense of ownership um, for the history in their area. The other thing, of course, that it does, it teaches drawing and interpretation skills. Um, and I'd be looking to produce some works, worksheets for school groups 
um, maybe a, a very simple booklet for some of the sites um, for uh, older visitors, um, which the sites can sell uh, to raise funds, um, but also um, for school groups and that sort of thing, um, a worksheet so that they can uh, do by learning. Uh, and um, that can be pitched at various different levels depending on the age of the the, the young people who are participating. And finally, the ultimate dream um, is a website to share research. Um, as as you many of you will know, um, the master's thesis, um, which presented all of the research so far, is available. Um, and I think Janie has put the link on the ACFA website, uh, for which I'm very grateful. Um, and uh, but I'm hoping that we will be able to produce um, so enough information to to generate a website um, uh, to to present it to a much wider public. So that's it. Thank you very much indeed. Um, here's some links to online uh, resources. Um, I'll leave that up. Um, I've added one. Um, the most recent one is the bottom one at St Magnus Cathedral. Um, their publication um, has had quite a bit of publicity recently, and I'm very pleased to say that um, I got my first academic reference in that publication because they referred to the research that had been undertaken um, uh, by you um, and so many others, um, for which I'm very, very grateful. Thank you.